So let's begin with a little meditation. We're going to quiet our minds first. Try to set a good try to set a good motivation as much as we can. So relax your bodies. Relax your minds. Place your attention on your respiration to begin with. Recognize when you're breathing in, when you're breathing out. Don't just let the stream of discursive thought continue below the surface of your mind. Try to focus on this one object. And then try to withdraw your attention when your mind's a little bit calmed to your mental consciousness. The area of your heart, the middle of your chest, your heart chakra. Usually quite closed, according to esoteric Buddhism. Take your attention away from your eyes, your ears, your nose consciousness, tongue, and body consciousness. Just watch the inner dialogue and emotions, perhaps upset, perhaps elated, maybe content, maybe annoyed. Various thoughts as objects, not just emotional tones, but also objects of thought fleeting through the space of your mind. Rather than getting caught up in the various appearances, refocus instead on the nature of the mind within which all of these are arising.
the sub subjective mind, which is clear, by nature unstained, transparent, unobstructed, unobstructing, All the various appearances passing through the mind, but try to sense always, keep your concentration on the spaciousness behind them. See if you can sense the presence of your, the appearance of your ego identity, your, your sense of self. And the fact that the mind, the mental consciousness is grasping to that as true, observing it and, and accepting it as true. I think this self-grasping, along with its ally, my self-cherishing thought, have been my real enemies this life. Always wanting to find happiness for myself alone, never to lose. Due to them, due to ignorance and self-cherishing, I've created so much negative karma, made myself unhappy, destroyed the, whatever virtue I have created. The same with all other sentient beings, all our former mothers. They're under the influence of ignorance, creating negative karma, which have repercussions now and in the future. Our discursive thoughts uncontrolled due to self-cherishing thought and ignorance. becoming the conditions, even now, whatever happens to us seems so unbearable. The slightest, slightest words we take as criticism, the slightest suffering we take as intolerable. If we lose the smallest thing, we find it a great loss. Same with all sentient beings. Whatever status they have right now, whether it be very high 
seemingly happy and secure and enviable this lifetime, they're still enmeshed. If they haven't controlled the mind, they're still enmeshed in cyclic existence. Worthy of our compassion. Just as we have compassion for ourselves. So thinking of the, the Buddha as the doctor that gave the medicine of the Dharma and the Dharma teachings that we're about to listen to as the medicine, the Arya Sangha are the beings that can help us take that medicine perfectly. with some confidence that the Dharma jewel really can protect us from suffering. In your mind, taking refuge in that. I think I'm going to participate tonight. Listen to the teachings. Keep concentration. Listen with a fresh mind, without preconceptions of my ego or using the Dharma to judge others. I'm going to listen in order to overcome my faults. Well, I have this incredibly precious opportunity, so rare, to be free to listen to the Dharma that's expressed explicitly. I'm going to listen to the teachings in order to become enlightened, awakened, for the welfare of all sentient beings. And the self that we think of is doing that action, the agent, from the very start trying to conjoin this action of listening with the perfection of wisdom, recognizing the agent is not truly existent, merely a name we impute to the body and mind, not the way that it appears to our consciousness as inherently existing somewhere behind the experiencer. The act of listening, merely imputed, can't be found anywhere. Just a name that we impute to the, to the succession of moments of paying attention to what our ear hears, thinking about it. The Dharma that we're listening to, the Dharma teachings, merely imputed to these succession of syllables, written words, and the realizations that they represent. And then relax. Bring your attention back. The present. Hmm. How's everyone? Good? A little bit rainy today. Okay. So, any questions about the material that we've been studying? Kangur is venerable, do you know? The whole set of Buddhist teachings? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. 
which ones? <laughs> so there are two in, in the uh, Tibetan, maybe you've heard in the uh, Indian, in, in the Indian language, in Sanskrit, um, in the Mahayana teachings, or in the Hinayana teachings, we talk about the Tripitaka. Have you heard of that before? Yes. The Tripitaka, the three baskets of teachings. Yes. Do you know? Who knows what the Tripitaka is? I forgot your name. Behind Bonnie, what's your name? Carl. 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 Do you know what the Tripitaka is? It's actually like tri, like our Western languages, three baskets. Uh, Karen, do you know what the Tripitaka is? Oh, you were no, looking I askance. Okay. I, I, I should know it. I've looked it up in the times. <laughs> so the Tripitaka mean the, the three baskets of Buddhist teachings that tell about talk about the three higher trainings. So they the basket of vinaya, the uh, discipline, or sometimes pronounced vinaya, vinaya pitika, vinaya pitika, and the sutra pitika. Mainly, although it, it talks, you know, the sutras seem to be talking about everything. The Buddha said in his own teachings, the sutra pitika mainly give advice how to practice the higher training of concentration, even though they seem to be talking about everything. And then the abhidharma pitika that talks about higher wisdom. So the three, the three baskets are mainly uh, explaining how to practice the three higher trainings, right? You know this down, right? Okay. So in, if, if you go to uh, different monasteries, uh, usually they'll have the, the, the works of Buddha, the Tripitaka. Let's say in, the, in India or Burma or Thailand, they'll have the Tripitaka in Pali or something. In the uh, Tibetan tradition, those texts that were in Sanskrit, that were translated of the, the, the let's say, the Mahayana Tripitaka, that were translated into Tibetan are called the Kangyur. Ka, the first syllable Ka, means speech, or it, it, honorific for speech, means the teachings, in this context, it means the teachings of Buddha. Gyur means, what do you mean? Yeah. means the translations, translation. So the translation of the speech of the Buddha. And the Tengyur is the translation of the Indian commentaries that existed uh, in ancient times that were translated into Tibetan. Also, Gyur again means translation. Ten is, is short for Tenshu, which means Shastra. Have you ever heard of that word? The, su the sutras and the shastras? Have you heard? Mm -hmm. Shastras mean the, the commentaries that explain how to put the teachings into practice. So in the, um, in the monasteries, you'll find the kangyur and the tengyur. And also you'll find in the kangyur, you'll also find some tantric teachings that were actually given by Buddha. So some part of the the Kangyur, there's sort of a sutra part of the Kangyur and a tantra part of the Kangyur. And for the Tengyur, the commentaries, there's also uh, some commentaries in, of the, uh, the, the tantras. So you'll see often in the monasteries above the altar, because the texts are considered to be, uh, well, let me ask, well, if you have, can you put a statue on a book? Is that a proper way to align things? Why not? Why? The Te text should be at the top. Why? The Dharma is the actual refuge. Dharma is actual refuge. Mm -hmm. Might be one reason. Usually it says that between the, the images, the representations of body, speech, and mind, like usually on the altar we have representations of the body, like the statues, the speech, which are the texts, and the mind, which are represented by what, usually? A stupa, a, a stupa often. Of those, that, that which is most immediately important to us is the speech. That which, uh, actually in Tantra also, I think there's some es esoteric explanation why the speech of Buddha is, the, the karma of that, created with that, is much more important. Like, for instance, keeping one's connection with the, the guru and so forth, keeping your, your words and so forth, very, very important for certain realizations in Tantra. But particularly, as, as Georgie said, because the, the Dharma is the, uh, the sp 
uh, the representations of the Buddhist speech represent the, the Dharma uh, also. That's considered to be more important, so you, they, they put the text above usually. And uh, then the body, the representations of body and mind below. Sometimes you could put them on the same level, but you wouldn't put a representation of the body on top of the representation of the speech, like that. So that's kind of the, the meaning of Kangyur. Kangyur kind of means a collection of Buddhist teachings. Can you say again what the Vinaya Sutra and Abhidharma represent? Mm -hmm. I got the Sutra's yeah. concentration. The Vinaya or Vinaya represent, it means discipline. So the Vinaya Pitaka are the collections of Buddhist teachings about discipline. Mainly, so it's talking there, talking about the vows of the monks and nuns and especially about the subtle workings of karma. Well, the, the vows of Pratimoksha includes the vows of the layperson also. And uh, the subtleties of karma, such as some of the things we're talking about here. You know, how, how would one know only because Buddha is a, as we'll see in the, uh, some of you are taking the low red class also, would talk about the kind of inferential cognition that arises from knowing that someone is a valid person. You know, to say, you know, how do we know that you know some of these things that are said here are true? That uh, by doing certain things, they have certain results, because the Buddha, who is a, a reliable, perfect teacher, which we have to v verify first in our own mind, uh, p taught that. Okay, the Sutra Pitaka mainly teach, teaches the higher training of concentration, although all subjects, all different kind of subjects are treated in the sutras, and the Abhidharma Pitaka mainly talks about higher wisdom, the training of higher wisdom, because we talk about that, the three higher trainings, higher training in discipline, ethics in other words, morality, shila, mm -hmm. the higher training in concentration, meditative states, and the higher training in wisdom. So those, all of the Buddha's teachings talk, can be said to be encompassed in the, the teachings about those three higher trainings. Yes? So on the altar, um, is it like if you have a picture of the Buddha on your wall and then you have the text on the altar, is that mm -hmm. okay? And also, can you have more than one pictures of Buddhas, like one on top of the other one? Mm -hmm. I think you can. You can have different, you can, you know, in general, you shouldn't, um, put in a lower position the text, but in the case that you can't sort of hang the text on the wall, that's, that's not really in your own mind disrespecting them, I don't think. But if you can put, say if you had a cabinet, you would put the texts, it's better to put the texts above rather than the lower shelves. And if you put, the te if you put representations of the, very, of the body of the Buddha or of your gurus, should the top, what, the, what should go higher, the Buddhas or the teachers or what? What goes above? Shakyamuni. Shakyamuni goes first, then the gurus below? No. 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 What, what goes higher? The, the gurus go first, um, then the representations of the, uh, the tantric representations of Buddha. In the center, so if you're if you're doing it if you if you're doing it centralized, so in the center should be the gurus and and on the periphery, the deities, and then the representations of the nirmanakaya form of Buddha. Say you know of the Buddhas like the five Buddha families and so forth. They would be outside of that, like on the refuge tree. First in the center are the gurus, and and above them are the gurus, and then below them or around them are the tantric deities. Outside of them are the, the Buddhas. You follow what I'm saying? And then outside of those are what? Below those? The, the Bodhisattvas. Below those or outside of those? Which one come first? No, the the there are two the pratika buddhas and the solitary realizers. Which one would come higher? Which are one are considered more 
solitary realizers. They're, they they are actually uh, take longer to achieve their goal. They have high, a greater accumulation of merit and they have greater realization in general than the shravakas. So, and then below those the shravakas or outside of those the shravakas, like the 16 arhats. In Mongolia, I heard that uh, Bakula Rinpoche will be giving a empowerment into the 16 arhats. Bakula Rinpoche is considered to be the emanation of one of the 16 arhats. 16 elders, they say, Neten or Stavira. And then below those, then the Dakas and Dakinis, and below those, the protectors, so the, 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 the super mundane protectors. So all of the, we'll be talking a little bit about protectors today in some of the verses. Okay. What's that book? Yeah, this is the essence of the Heart Sutra. The essence of the Heart Sutra, the Dalai Lama's teaching yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, they talk about the come here and the tank you're here and about page 66. And so there you go. Okay. Book. There you go. If you have that, you can check that. Okay. okay. Anyone else have some question? Have you been, uh, have you been reading ahead? Yeah. Okay, good. Some have. Maybe not everyone, but some. George. I'm listening. I would like for us to start saying Vajrasattva with every verse. <laughs> You'd like to say Vajrasattva. You're welcome to say Vajrasattva with every verse. Yeah. <laughs> Someone might want to say Yamantaka with every verse. Isn't it? Oh, okay, Yamantaka, whatever. Um, but, um, Here, the actual text doesn't have anything else in it, so we're just we're just going by the text. Okay, you can be saying Vajrasattva continuously. I think oh, that's a good that's idea too, in your mind. It's probably very, very useful. Okay. Okay, so let's go on. Um, last time, I think we got up, we finished verse 30. Is that right? Just finished verse 30. <coughs> when I delight in afflictions and greatly dis end am greatly distracted as the wheel of my own evil deeds turned upon me from not meditating on impermanence and the shortcomings of cyclic existence. We talked about this last time, right? From now on I shall increase my dissatisfaction for cyclic existence. I think I might have mentioned then, Lama Soparimshe mentions sometimes the reason when in the morning that uh, even though the alarm clock goes off or whatever, that we don't get up. Uh, you know, it's just a, we're, we're content to sit in our warm bed, or you can take by analogy. You can just think of, you know, ourself not going out and actually doing more dharma practice, actually confronting our delusions and so forth, while we have the opportunity. The reason for that is because we haven't contemplated the shortcomings of cyclic existence. We kind of think being in the warm bed or having, you know having everything go right for a certain pe period of time is okay, and we're, we're secure in that. But all of that's impermanent, right? So that's in, it's, it's very important. And the Lan Rim is taught again and again the, the need every morning to meditate on impermanence and to recognize what, even if we w were to live a long life, how this life is fleeting every second and how short, how short it will be so 31, when things, when things get worse, no matter what I do, it is a weapon of my own evil deeds turned upon me for disparaging moral causality and dependent origination. From now on, I shall strive to accumulate merit. So here, sometimes I like to get some alternate translations looking at the Tibetan. It says, when I, again, this the same word, here it's translating as disparage. I don't know if it's been that way all the time. It might have been pretty much. When I, when I don't take seriously, it's ketu sepa, when I, when I kill the difference, in other words, or, uh, of, uh, here it says moral causality. Leidang gyude ketu sepai. Lay means actions. Gyude means cause and effect. Actions 
and causes and effects. So it doesn't actually say the words dependent arising, but one can kind of infer that from that. When, you, when we don't pay attention, not only to impermanence, but then we don't pay attention and we don't consider important uh, the law of karma, the, the inner law of cause and effect, the psychic level of cause and effect, One of the consequences, and many consequences of that, but, it, but it's saying here, when things get worse, no matter what I do. So what's the implication of that? Say, say things, you're trying to, uh, you know, you have some problem, and you try to do something outside to get rid of that problem, and it doesn't go away. Oftentimes, that's because we haven't observed. We, we're looking to, to f try to find a cause to rectify the situation, often outside, I think rather than looking to find the inner cause. Right? When things get worse, no matter what I do, it is the weapon of my own evil deeds turned upon me for disparaging, ignoring the law of cause and effect, the fact that things arise in dependence on causes and conditions. So from now on, I shall strive to accumulate merit. So one of the, the um, verses in the seven-point training of the mind Maybe you know when it talks about uh, the the, oh, the four means of transforming different conditions into the path. One of them is when things go wrong, when you're not when you're not finding what you need, conditions and so forth, to try to accumulate the merit to do so, rather than feeling frustrated or trying to accumulate the outer causes. You know, get more friends or get more money or, you know whatever, by, due to our not paying attention to cause and effect in the past, we haven't abandoned non-virtue, so we're going to have problems now. We haven't accumulated virtue to any appreciable extent, so our, our collection of virtue is very small. So this is, th this is the real inner reason why things don't go right even no matter what we do outside. Did some of you read Geshe's commentary here? Let's see, just see what Geshe had to say here. This verse addresses the situation in which everything goes against you, no matter what you do, in your personal business or spiritual life, you are unable to succeed in anything. This type of misery is the result of disregarding the laws of karma and cause and effect. So that liter literally, that's what, Gesh that's what the text says, karma and cause and effect, doesn't say dependent arising, and performing non-virtuous actions that harm others. Therefore, you should resolve from now on to be patient with others, behave virtuously, and understand the laws of reality, the truth of suffering and its cause. If we strive to do only what is right, not to harm any sentient beings and to work for their benefit, we must expect to meet many hardships, which, however, we should look upon as opportunities to practice patience. From now on, we should keep in mind karma and its results and act accordingly. So one of the things that, you know, that the teachers often say is that if we want to be happy, we have to create the causes of it. We all want to be happy. But usually what we're, what we're doing is we're seeking outer causes, outer conditions for what we consider to be happiness and security. Recognizing that those outer conditions can give some kind of relief, they, they can be conditions for our other karma to ripen, isn't it? But they can't themselves, the outer things that we do, can't actually create the causes for happiness. Like say collecting money or building a house or finding the right friends or whatever. Even if you find new companions, there's no guarantee that you're going to be happy with them, is there? What do you think? No guarantee. Uh, depends on your karma. Even you collect, you know, lots of resources, there's no guarantee that you're going to be happy because of that. I like to think of it like this. It, it, you've heard, you, you know well, the law of cause and effect, but some people, just as a, to introduce it sometimes, I explain, say someone is on the street 
you know, like we, we think of criminals sometimes as how could they be, how could they get this success? How do they have this happiness? It doesn't seem right. They steal a car, they have car or the mafia chieftain with all the money and power and everything. How is that? How can that be? What do you think, Don? How could they have happiness if they're only creating non-virtue? They must have created virtuous karma, possibly with generosity. There could be other things also. Uh, like people look up to them and so forth. They have certain charisma because of maybe guarding their speech in some past lives. So what they do now sometimes is just a, you know, the cooperative condition for their virtuous karma of the past to ripen. Sometimes bad things happen to good people, isn't it? I know there, there's some book, I think there's some book on the bestseller list like that, when bad things happen to good people or something. How does that happen? From, from a Christian tradition, that's one of the great uh, enigmas, isn't it, and philosophical questions. And of course, there's solution to that also, that's God's testing and so forth. But from a Buddhist perspective, how do we understand it? How, do, how can bad things happen to good people? The ripening, even though they're good now, they're creating the causes of happiness in the future, but still negative karma from the past can ripen. So as trying to practice the mind training, what we try to do is even when bad things happen, we hear criticism or when we lose or we get sick or whatever, to try to see that in a positive light rather than creating more negative karma to, to suffer the same thing in the future. And when we don't have what we want, to try to create the causes for it. So that's kind of one of the implications, I think, of this, of this advice of this verse. George, when you talk about um, creating the causes for it, aren't the actions that we're doing now causes for things much, much distant in the future? So how can we create the cause of something that we want now, you know, or need in our lives now? Well, we can, we can start to, there are different ways. Some karma that we create this lifetime could ripen this lifetime. In general, the karma that we create with our parents when we're young can ripen later in life because they're heavy objects of karma. But the, uh, the karma that we create with respect to the gurus and the Buddhas could even ripen sooner because they're, they're the heaviest objects of karma. I think it's said that, um, like in, in the practice of guru devotion, if you see the, your guru as the Buddha, that is to say, not, not a physical representation, you just say, I don't care about these people, you know, these, these gurus, they're corrupt, they're okay. but Buddha is my guru. You can, you can receive very powerful blessings that way in your mind stream to make transformation, and you create some virtuous karma that could ripen in uh, the not-so-distant future. But if you have a physical representation who is guiding you, giving you advice, and say, do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that, uh, if you take them as your teacher, you receive very fast blessings. If you can see that physical representation as enlightened also, as a manifestation of Buddha, you receive powerful and quick blessings. And because of the, the it said that uh, the kindness of the gurus, because they're leading us to enlightenment, they're the, they, because of that kindness, they're the heaviest objects of karma. So that karma could ripen even this lifetime. That's why it's possible, I think, in the practice of Tantra, be, besides other kinds of practices also, be collecting merit through bodhicitta and other things, why it's possible to find um, karma that ripens this lifetime, that especially if we're practicing virtuously, dedicating it, that can lead to realizations quickly, not necessarily in distant, distant lifetimes. Also, by purifying, like say, doing tonglen, <coughs> changing our attitude in, inside, then that can help to purify very heavy negative karma that can be preventing us from finding happiness, achieving our goals, that it can purify negative karma that might be impediments to our life, to our wealth, and so forth. So I think both of those together can bring about, in general, the ordinary karma that we create may not ripen this lifetime, but especially with respect to the gurus and the, in the practice of Tantra especially, or in the bodhisattva path with bodhicitta motivation, it can ripen more quickly.
both in purifying negative karma and accumulating virtue. And when somebody talks about trying to remove obstacles by doing certain practices, they're not talking about the same thing as trying to remove, uh, you know, purify bad karma. Yeah, it can be. Uh, like, for instance, there are different kinds of obstacles. Um, there can be, just like when we talked about the Maras, there are outer Maras and inner Maras. Well, there's, there's really, there, there's some outer obstacles and, and there are solely inner obstacles also. Even the outer obstacles, their appearance depends on our karma. You know, they're like, say, the rats that are eating your food or, or you know, the, uh, the people that are, are giving you a hard time. By doing, by purifying the karma that you've created with them in the past, in, say, doing Tonglen, and uh, other kinds, like in Chu practice, the, the practice that was done in uh, many of our gurus, Lama Supra she likes to practice very much. You know Chu? You know what Chu is? Do you know, what, what, how do you translate Chu? Chu means to slay or to cut. And it, and it kind of means, sometimes it looks like it means ch you would pronounce it should. It's not pronounced should. It's spelled Yes, that's one way to pronounce it, yeah. But it's, it's pronounced ch. Uh, that means to slay the ego, to cut off the ego. So it might be practiced in a, a very fearful place, like a cemetery, where, where you go to that and the, the ego can manifest due to fear very strongly. Actually, you can pr practice true in the mark, you know, just in everyday life, because a lot of times when people confront you, the ego comes up very, very positively. You say, this is the time I have to practice true. True means to use that situation to, to develop the two bodhicittas. It's a, it's a way of mind training also, to cut off the self-cherishing by losing, by giving the victory to the others. In, in true, sometimes one imagines giving one's own body to the spirits in the cemetery, in the charnel ground offering to all the different spirits. And also at that point, meditating on selflessness. When the ego arises, recognizing how strongly this appears as real, but if one's familiar with emptiness, how it is actually empty of that appearance that it has of being real. So that's one way of seeing the object of negation very, very clearly. So cutting off the outer obstacles by offering to them, you know, and there are various kinds of, various kinds of uh, ways like this. One of our teachers, Geshe Rapton, uh, he used to, when he was criticized at the monastery, when people talked about him behind his back or because he was, he was uh, a very gifted teacher, maybe he had many students and people out of envy might have talked about him behind his back, <clears throat> um, it's said in the monasteries that's one of the best ways when people talk about you behind your back it's one of the best ways of purifying your negative karma of, of verbal karma and so what Geshe would do is he would invite them to his uh, room to his little living quarters at, for a meal and he would offer them momos you know momos? Mm -hmm. like most uh, in the Tibetan monastery the most tasty you know, the nicest thing you can offer someone is a, is, a, is a meal of momo. So he'd offer the people who were criticizing him and behind his back, he'd offer them momos. Not like kind of, I don't know, it could be kind of artificial, you know. The, you know oh, here, thanks so much for criticizing me. You know, you jerk. Or <laughs> yeah, give them bad tasting momos or something, right? right? Put some hot pepper in them or something like that. Not like that, but, but recognizing that they were, they were benefiting him, and in so doing, purifying that negative karma. When we start to recognize, it's not easy, I think, when we start to recognize really sincerely the self-cherishing thought as our enemy, that's a big turning point. That starts to purify these obstacles, outer and inner. And there are particular ways of practicing to overcome the outer hindrances or obstacles and the inner ones. Like that, this is mainly what we're talking about. So let's go on. So 32, when all the religious rites I perform go awry, <laughs> it's the wheel of my own evil deeds that returned upon me. 
for looking to the dark quarters for help. From now on, I shall turn away from the dark quarter. <laughs> Geshele doesn't say this in his commentary, but um, when I was reading that, I just wanted to the dark quarter, instead of just like being evil spirits that we label evil spirits, that was similar to the, the verse prior to that, where the dark quarter is really kind of like the lying, turning to like ordinary appearances and external things. Is that... Well, here, dark, the, what they've translated as dark quarter doesn't have to be translated that way. You can just say the, the, the black side, not chok. Chok means direction or side, or nak means black or dark. So it means, a, a, in this sense, it's, there's no pejorative sense. Sometimes in, in modern political correctness, one can't say badness is collect, connected with blackness, right? And whiteness is, is good. But in general, this is the language that's being used. So just to recognize that when it says the dark quarter, it's talking about what we've relied on before, our, 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 our baser instincts and, and negativity and so forth, and bad friends and so forth. Um, he says evil spirits and dark forces, though, when he yeah. has commentary. Yeah, yeah. Right, that's why I say our baser instincts, evil friends, evil forces. Um, but does it have to be really evil? I mean, or is it just dark because it's ignorant? Like, well, here, 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 what, what, and just let me, let me, just, just let me explain first. Karen, what, what I was saying is, in general, the dark side okay. means all of these different things. Here in this context, when it says looking to the dark side for help, that means um, instead of seeking you know, uh, solutions to our problems by uh, looking for help from the, the white side, from the Dharma. We've sought help from either, either by doing rituals, you know, sometimes people invoke protectors, worldly protectors. We don't have so much of that here, I don't think, do we? I don't know. Italy is quite... Anyone here Italian? Italy, Italy is kind of... Uh, Sicilian. Sicilian, okay, even better. <laughs> you know, oftentimes people um, have, uh, they pay uh, others to do, put evil curses on someone. You know, they go to someone and they, they do kind of, play. And, and we have in, in this, con in this uh, hemisphere also, in, in, what is it, in the Caribbean and uh, voodoo, voodoo and so forth. Uh, if you actually investigate, there are some some things that these things, some forces that these things can do, if done in certain ways. So obviously in doing those kind of things, in relying on the dark side, in, in for protectors or bad friends or evil, you know, you know, calling up the mafia to get your way or whatever, you know, the spiritual mafia, or the non-spiritual mafia, the psychic mafia, uh, that is, that's what's meant here by relying on the dark quarter for help. So. Whatever we do, uh, the rituals that we perform, say calling upon the white forces, if they don't have any effic efficacy, it's because we haven't really created the karma for them to be effective. We've relied on the black side in the past. So from now on, I shall turn away from the, the dark side, okay? the evil empire. Okay. That makes sense, isn't it? Ronald Reagan would be happy to hear that. Isn't he the one that t used that term? Evil empire? Okay. George Lucas, too. George Lucas. Oh, no, that's George Lucas. Sorry. Darth Vader. Darth Vader, right. So, when my pra 33, when my prayers to the three jewels go unanswered, it is the will of my own evil deeds turned upon me for not believing in, in Buddhahood. From now on, I shall rely on the three jewels alone. So we haven't, here, Sangepa, here they take as Buddhahood. Does Geshe take it as Buddhahood in his commentary, or just, or the Buddha? Well, not refuge, he kind of interprets it as taking the refuge. Mm -hmm. He says here, 
you, you may wonder why your requests are not fulfilled if you, if you pray to the triple gem and blame the three jewels. Such thinking is wrong. The three jewels which we take refuge, the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. The Buddha is the perfect teacher, the Dharma is a perfect teaching, the Sangha is the assembly of religious persons. So here, the way that the translators, the Western translators have taken it, sounds like it just means Buddha or Buddhahood. But I think it, it's referring to that whole, that whole complex of, uh, of taking refuge in the three jewels. When my prayer to the three jewels go unanswered, it's the wheel of sharp weapons coming back for not believing in Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, not having confidence. Iche in Tibetan, the word that's in the Tibetan text, means uh, when we talk about the different kinds of faith, one of the kinds of faith is one that's dependent on conviction. So here it means not just believing, but having conviction in them. Conviction is a, is a, can be of varying degrees, but sometimes conviction, faith of conviction, is not yet a realization. It's just like a, a correct belief, but, but leaning in the right direction, you know, a proper, a correct relief, belief. From now on, I shall rely on the three jewels alone. So, yeah, sometimes... Yeah, you know, what what you know? People also denigrate in the Christian tradition. They denigrate God or whatever because he didn't answer their prayers, or bad things happened. Here you hear about people giving up religion for that reason, isn't it? Do you, do you hear that? You know, something bad happens to them, or I gave up religion because this or that. So this is the 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 reason for that is because we didn't really rely on the triple gem in the past. And so whatever kind of prayers we make now are not going to have much efficacy. 34. When conceptual constructions rise up as pollution, demons, and evil spirits, it is the wheel, it is the weapon of my own evil deeds turned upon me for sinning against the gods and mantras. From now on I shall crush all conceptual concept constructions. So here, Geshe Darge, is the, the translation that John Landau and Alex Burson and the Translating Bureau did many years ago, although they actually they try to put uh, a bit of commentary into that. It's not literally what, what it says here. They say, when prejudice, polio, or strokes have us crippled and external forces or harm rise against us, this is the wheel of sharp weapons returning full circle upon us from wrongs we have done. Till now we have collected vast stores of non-virtue by breaking our vows and offending protectors in our practice from guru devotion to tantra. Hereafter, let's banish all prejudiced views. So that's a little, some, some, a little closer, I think, the, the way that they've translated here. Um, Nam tok diptang dundu langbe se. So at the time of the arisal, or rising, mm, when, when our conceptual thoughts are namtok, that means uh, our, you know, when, I, when we're, we're doing our meditation, all this discursive thinking that's going on, our, our, our you know, our uh, opinions, our conceptions, this person is right, this person is right, I'm, this person's wrong, I'm right, this is all namtok. I, I remember Lama Yeshi many times, have you, have you ever heard, do you ever hear Lama say Namtok? Or, yes, uh, yes. Namtok. Oh, it's just it's just it's just your idea. You know, it's just you know, it's just your conception. Usually, it's it's related with conceiving things to be truly existent. So when our 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 Namtok, when our discursive thoughts, our conceptual constructions rise up as uh, what is this? Dipdang Dundu. Don is definitely spirits and kind of uh, demons. And dip has different connotations. It can mean pollution. It can mean kind of dip. When, when people have strokes in Tibet, they call it drip, due to some kind of spirits. So it can be, and, or sometimes can mean polio. So they've taken it that way in this text. Here he says, as pollution, demons, and evil spirits. So it means when our, our own mind, our own preconceptions, our opinions, our opinionated mind, our selfish mind rises up as uh, different kinds of forms. It could be external demons, it can be pollutions, it can be some kind of hindrance to us. This is the wheel of 
uh, sharp weapons coming back for sinning against the gods and mantras, it says there. Uh, here it means, I think it means, negative karma that we create with respect to the deities, whether it be in Tantra, we didn't keep the commitments, we took initiations of various deities, or, or the worldly deities, protectors and so forth, negative things that we've done. And also a negative deeds that we've done with respect to taking tantric vows, breaking our commitments. Sometimes um, in Tibet, not so, not so long ago, uh, in, here also in India, uh, the, some of the Tibetan lamas had a, occasion to have strokes and so forth, and sometimes it was explained that this was a result of their improper practice of uh, the practice of protectors and so, and so forth, various worldly protectors relying upon them with not the best of intentions. So from now on I shall crush all conceptual conceptions. What is it? Conceptual constructions. Conceptual conceptions. Dani Namtok Tamche Shombaraja. I shall crush them or break them. Banish, it says in the other text. Don't you how much time we have? Three minutes. Three minutes, okay. So, yeah, done. Can you explain a little bit about what's meant by vows made to worldly gods? Worldly gods? Um, As opposed to the super mundane? I don't know if it says, does, did Geshe say vows made in respect to Yeah. yeah. So sometimes, um, here the gods don't have to be only like of the desire realm gods, the devas. Sometimes like you can make vows, like in, in Hinduism and in, in Vedic tradition, you can make vows to Brahma or other kinds of uh, Vedic gods. They, they themselves are within cyclic existence. They may be of the deva realm, they may actually be spirits, they may be pretas, different kinds of spirits. In the Bon tradition of Tibet, that's one of the ways that one got a lot of power. Also in our shamanistic traditions of the West, of, of the Americas, South America, other shamanistic religions, there is some power that can be attained through that kind of knowledge of uh, invoking spirits, what one might call gods, divinities of some kind, and offering them something. Sometimes it involves things that they like very much, like blood, and uh, uh, offering, offering them things that they want, that, you, that they make known to you, either to other people of the past, that tradition come down to the future of how to invoke them. But if you don't please them, they can cause great harm, it is if you break your promises, if you displease them. Uh, Sirkun Sencha Brimbeshe used to say, relying upon protectors was very, very dangerous. It wasn't something that, you know, like Westerners like to think that this is a great practice, doing these protector pujas and everything. Sometimes, His Holiness also has said, this sometimes can miss the point. We take more refuge in these protectors than we do in the triple gem, especially if they're worldly protectors. It is possible to take, to you, to call for help to various kinds of protectors or worldly spirits, but not to rely on them ultimately. But if you, because if you displease them, Sarkun Rinpoche used to say, it's like a, your relationship with a little tiger cub. At first they come and they lick your feet, you know, they, they, they're very cuddly, and you know, you're creating a connection with them. Then when they get bigger, what happens? If you displease them, you know, one swipe of the claw of their paw can destroy you. So that growing in this context means you're growing karmic connection with them. So the greater your karmic connection with these various uh, deities, the greater the, uh, the danger if you don't, if you break your commitments to them, if you, you know, you, uh, whatever, you don't, you don't offer your cup of blood to them that week or you don't, you know, do what pleases them. Should we take a break? Have a, have a cup of blood? I mean, uh, a cup of, <laughs> cup of tea. <laughs> Let's take a short break. Okay, Beth, you had a question. Teacher, and the very first day, I 
took this initiation mm-hmm. because I have a strong emotional feeling. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then I realized, because I had never done that before in my life, I realized afterward, and I did the initial practices, you know, mm-hmm. um, but then, then I stopped. And, and then I realized what a huge thing I had done. Right. This, this was a huge thing. Right. And, um, you know, I've, I've grappled with that since then and, and haven't gone forward in that path because I realized that I really didn't know anything about the path. And so I realized that it was my own fault that I did that, but I've also seen that happen with other people. And I think in general it's good like for the teachers in paths to like have some responsibility <coughs> toward like new people to maybe not let them take initiations. I mean, I think it's, right. a, it's a subtle thing because of course, they're yeah. overwhelmed and they, they feel like, oh, well, this is going to be my I agree with you. Life, I agree you know? with you. But one can't really judge because uh, sometimes if the, like say, if the Buddha was actually here, he might, he might say, uh, you know, come, take right. this initiation. He, he right. may see that you have some karmic connection. Oftentimes, many times my teacher, Lama Yeshe, when I was at uh, different of our centers, I was a spiritual coordinator, and um, before Lama gave a course, there would be certain requirements to take a tantric initiation. You would have had to have taken refuge for at least six months, done a course in the Lan Rim, and uh, had various other qualifications. And lo- they would be very strict, you know, for the course. And then at the last minute, someone would come up, some old fellow or young lady or someone, and, when they would, and they would want to take the course. And, I would, and I, of course, I would come to Lama because they, they said, please ask Lama if I can take the course. I would go expecting Lama to say, no, they don't have the qualifications. And he said, of course, dear. Mm-hmm. There are many doorways to the Dharma, he said. So sometimes, I think, in general, that's a very good advice, but sometimes what you did was not necessarily stupid. It may have been, uh, at the time, you know, not the right time for you to practice at that level, but sometimes, obviously, that's impelled you to go back and look for the bases. So for some people, you know, being tossed in the deep end, like my, so my grandpa taught us to swim, or not to swim, took us out in the rowboat in Lake Geneva, here you go. <laughs> Did, you, did anyone learn to swim that way? Yeah. <laughs> I don't swim well to this day, but anyway, I had to Please learn after fine. that. But um, sometimes being tossed in the deep end, you know, suddenly you've got these commitments and you realize you don't have any bodhicitta. You don't even know what re- renunciation is. You don't have any understanding of emptiness. So you have to go back and learn about it because you f- have a, a sense of responsibility. So that, that can be good. Of course, in the hands of just ordinary people, like myself, for instance, if I were to give some tantric initiation, not having any kind of quality, that would be completely inappropriate because not knowing what the, the other people's minds are like, you know, can be very, very dangerous. So it requires, uh, really, the tantric initiations. We, it became very popular in Tibet the, to take tantric initiations and practice tantra, but to really practice um, or say, to really be a tantric teacher, you have to have immense qualities to be really a tantric guru. And, yeah, so, I wouldn't say what, what you had done was stupid. It might have been, um, it may not have seemed like the right time, but in your case, it sounds like uh, maybe th- what, whatever teacher might have had some particular reason for you know, luring you like the male siren, into taking the initiation, and then you got connected and, and studied more. Well, actually, it wasn't a tantra initiation, but yeah. nonetheless. Okay, yeah. whatever. <laughs> okay, so let's go a little bit further. So 35, when I wander far from home like a helpless person, it is the weapon of my own evil deeds turned upon me for driving spiritual teachers and others from their homes. From now on, I shall not expel anyone from their home. Okay. So, again, when it talks about the gurus, the spiritual teachers, this is the heaviest objects of karma. Like in the past, uh, like the Chinese, when they uh, expelled the Dalai Lama and others from Tibet. Just imagine the kind of wandering that they are going to do 
not only in uh, other lifetimes as humans, but throughout the six realms because of upseating, you know, heavy objects of karma. Usually, with, with respect to karma, heaviest, heaviest objects are the gurus and the manifestations of Buddha that teach us. The next heaviest objects of karma are our own parents and those that have been very kind to us. We were talking about this. Some of you attended the, uh, the teaching that Lama Zopa Rinpoche gave recently on the, the 16 points. Remember some of, these, some of these points about respecting the parents and so forth that were instituted by the king uh, Sun Sen Gambo, Sun Sen Gambo, one of the first Tibetan kings in historical times. Um, one of some of the, the, these points that he tried to institute as general rules for the pop population, the humans, was were to respect those that are higher than ourselves because they're they're, especially our parents because they're very heavy objects of karma. They've been very kind to us, whether we recognize it or not. Seems to be kind of like a something that's modern people are a bit oblivious of. You know, parents, my parents, kind? Are you kidding me? You know, some people will say, or especially if they've been, had bad conditions with their parents, they've been molested or their parents seem to ignore them or whatever. But their parents gave them the incredible preciousness of this body, which again, they may not recognize. They may say, this life, this is miserable. What did they give me? You know, because they don't recognize. It doesn't mean, just because they perceive it that way, in their ignorance, it doesn't mean that that's the way it is. This, this life as a human is incredibly precious. So to have been given the, the, the condition of people uh, raising us, they fed us, they, they gave us a certain amount of education, and uh, here we are now be, due to their kindness. So they're very, very heavy objects of karma. So if we were to expel them from their homes, or the gurus or others, because it says uh, spiritual teachers and others, when I wander from far from home like a helpless person. Wamli Wangme Chesu Kampa Kempese Kampese Kyampese. This is what thirty five, right? Wangme Mita Chesu Kyampese at the time of of wandering in sort of distant places, Chesu abroad like a helpless person, you know, like a, like a, a beggar. This is the, uh, the karma of forcing out from their places the lamas and so forth. So now I will not uproot from their location anyone. So try to recognize, recognize that. Do you ever have that experience of wandering hopelessly? No? no? Maybe you will. Yeah, sometimes seems like anyway, okay. So thirty six. When calamities occur like frost and hail, what that means is when calamities like frost and hail occur, right? I don't know. It, it does sound a little bit funny when you say when calamities occur like frost and hail. Almost sounds like <laughs> calamities. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So when calamities like frost and hail occur. It is the weapon of my own evil deeds turned upon me for not properly guarding my vows and moral conduct. From now on, I shall keep my vows and moral conduct pure. So some of these things you might say, well, who, who, who can say? Well, it could have been anything that caused that frost and hail. But these are, I think all of these particular points were taken from various teachings of Buddha, where Buddha prophesies that particular kinds of actions do have environmental effects or other kind of effects on us. This is not just the imagination of the author or trying to use, derive some logical connection from them. They were taught by the Buddha, these particular karmic connections. Um, I interesting, the word for hail is ser, sera which is the name of one of the monasteries. Some, you know, Sarah J. Monastery, Sarah May. Sarah Monastery, uh, I think, I don't know, I can't remember exactly the legend. I've heard that the, it arose, the name arose because the place where it was going to be built was a place where a big hailstorm came, something like that. So this is the same word. Uh, Whoa, softballs. Be, that would 
That would be big hail. That would be awfully big hail. Hail to the chief. Okay. Seser lasok midu jungwe se. So when undesirable things such as, it says calamities, when undesirable things such as frost and hail occur, this is the wheel of sharp weapons coming back from not guarding appropriately, sushin, my damsig means samayas and sulchim means ethics. What does he translate it as here? Not, not guarding my vows and moral conduct. Literally, damsik is, you know, for those of you who've taken some tantric things, it means samaya, those, those things that you promise to do. Usually vows, although it's not completely like that, usually there's a difference between vows and, and, uh, and uh, words of honor. Words of honor, samaya, mean things that you promise to do in general, although there's certain things you promise not to do. And vows are things you take a commitment not to do. You restrain yourself, like tie yourself from doing those. So it's talking about not appropriately guarding those. Su shin masung be. Now I will make pure my uh, words of honor and so forth. Here it says, I shall keep my vows in moral conduct. It doesn't say that, it just says, damsik lasok sangba cha. I shall, I shall act purely, uh, I will make pure, create pure vows, do, you know, pr promote pure vows and so forth. So when there are different kinds of negativities that we can create. Some of them are called natural negativities, what the Buddha called rangshin kanamat kanamatoa in Tibetan. I don't know the, the Sanskrit word. Kanamatoa in Tibetan means kind of wrongdoing or, or evil. Rangshin means natural. So r natural wrongdoings, the Buddha taught, were things that whether you, you know, whether you took a vow or not to do them, you're, you're creating negative karma, like uh, killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, lying, and so forth. Then there was another category of negativities, Kanamatua, the Buddha talked about, called uh, Chepa Kanamatua, Kanamatua, which means uh, wrongdoings due to formulation or due to the rules that the Buddha set down. Like for instance, the, the Buddha said the monks and nuns should not do certain things. Even though those things were not naturally negative, because they had taken on that particular commitment, they, uh, breaking those commitments became negativities. So here it's talking about both kinds of of things that, you know, when we, when we don't keep our morality, things that we've promised to do and promised uh, to avoid, different kinds of outer conditions can occur, such as um, having a period of frost and hail and so forth. So in order to, to purify that, to recognize that as the result of our own past negative karma, even if that, even if there might have been other causes of it, karmic causes of it, to rec excuse me, recognize that in your own continuum, and to try to experience that, what might otherwise be suffering or adverse condition, with a mind of at least equanimity or even joy, to transform that into the path by imagining, especially if one's doing tonglen, imagining, by my experiencing this, may I which is due to my negative karma of the past, may others who have that same negative karma in their continuum to suffer in the future, may they be purified. So by bearing it that way, putting, it, putting the suffering on the self-cherishing thought rather than on the self, remember what we we're, we're, we're talking about before, not thinking just I'm gonna kill you, you know, kill yourself or, or martyr or, or whatever. One has to find that sensitive vital point, the self-cherishing thought, and make it erode away due to experiencing the suffering. When I, a greedy person, lose my wealth, it is the weapon of my own evil deeds turned upon me for not giving charity or making offerings to the Three Jewels. From now on, I will zealously make offerings and give charity. So here again, this is this is one of the, the famous observations 
that uh, come in the sutra. Uh, I think there's a famous verse that Nargajuna quotes from the sutras that says, uh, from due to charity, resources, due to morality, high status. In other words, um, this is something, th these are hidden phenomena that we can realize, right? At first we don't realize that giving brings back resources. We think, the, 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 the miserly mind thinks giving depletes your resources, right? Uh, my rich, some of my rich friends are the stingiest people. Sometimes the, the poorest people I know are the most generous. They give you anything. It's not always the case, of course. Sometimes I think people in the world think that the reason they got rich was because they, they, didn't, they didn't deplete their resources. I certainly have that kind of segment of my mind that still thinks that way. So the Buddha taught that the, the causes of resources were giving, and the, source, and the causes of high status that is being born as humans and gods was uh, observing morality. That is not creating negative karma, creating virtuous karma to be born as a human, a human or the gods. And of course, the other six perfections, those are the first two perfections, right? Generosity, morality. Patience gives what? You know what the result of patience is? A, a pleasant appearance, right, and so forth. The, the other perfections have particular ripening effects from them. <clears throat> so here it's saying, um, when we encounter not having things, not having resources, which is this 37, right? Dupa chela jorpe pongbe say, at the time of uh, being deprived of due to, said being deprived of wealth, yet uh, having great desires. In other words, not, not, treat, not expecting, not experiencing this with equanimity. Jindang konchok chupa mach magi pe. It is due, it's a wheel of sharp weapons coming back from not having uh, created charity or made off, uh, made chupa, made puja to the Please that which pleased the triple gem, because that's the word. That's the meaning of puja, right? Do you know when we talk about puja, lama chopa? You know lama chopa puja. Mm -hmm. Chopa means to means the, the Sanskrit word puja. Do you know that word puja, Bonnie? Do you know that word? What is it? What does kind of mean to you? Kind of means. It seems like it means offering. The the actual the in Buddhism the etymology of puja. puja is to please. So it means to please the object of the puja, like say the triple gem or the gurus. And although we might think, in certain contexts, we might think that they'll be pleased by us making offerings, that's not the main thing that pleases them. The main thing that pleases them is us creating virtue. That's why in, the, in, the, in all of the pujas, like the seven limb puja, all of the, all of the ritual offerings to the triple gem always have those se seven elements. You know what they are, the seven limb puja? What are they? Prostration. Prostration. Seven, seven. Yeah. Prostration, first of all, paying homage. Confessing. So prostration, confession comes next or no? Offering. Offerings. Offering. Offering. Confession. 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 Rejoicing. Rejoicing. So it can be in different orders, in different contexts. Requesting the Buddhas to remain and to turn the wheel of Dharma. And seventh, Dedication. dedicating the merits. So Maitreya, Buddha explained, the Buddha explained also that those seven were like the essential elements to create all the, the virtuous karma that were necessary, that's necessary in order to, you know, to make spiritual realizations on the path. Those are the essential elements. So that's why all of the pujas engage in those. <clears throat> Offering particularly helps to overcome the negative karma we've done due to miserliness and to create merit with respect to the merit field. And that's what pleases the gurus. That's what pleases the Buddhas. It's not like Vajrayogini is up there thinking, hmm, I can't wait to get that mango. You know, or, or that, the, the, the cherry, that cherry cheesecake they've offered. Mm, I'm really pleased. And then if you only offer a piece of toast or something, you know, you, not pleased. It's not like that. It depends upon our state of mind. So 
here it's 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 a, it's it's making puja to the triple gem, making charity or uh, chuba doesn't mean only uh, offering; it also means these seven limbs. So from now on, I will strive in both puja and offerings and in the charity. Yeah, so when we don't, this is like also the, one of the essential things all the time in, in the mind training. Whenever we recognize things going wrong, when people abuse us, criticize us, and we get angry, we should recognize instead of getting angry at the outer person, this is giving us an opportunity to look at our own mind and to purify our negative karma. When we're deprived of our wealth, when our wealth goes away, this is obviously a result of our not having accumulated enough merit of resources in the past. So to, then to strive to use that opportunity to in, to, in a positive way, to cause you to strive to create the causes of wealth. Make sense? What do you think, buddy? Crystal clear. Okay, crystal. I don't have to say crystal clear, just crystal, right? Um, some, many, quite a few years ago, when we were in Italy, Institute of Lama Sankava, one time Lama Sopa Rinpoche gave the uh, last part of the wealth deities. Was any of you, were any of you here or there? Maybe Oma, were you, did you come to that? No, uh, not. The, 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 the Norla, they call them, the wealth deities, it, during a summer course. It was, can you imagine this? It was the most subscribed course of all time. <laughs> Everyone wanted to take that course. And Rinpoche was not, did not take the aspect of being pleased. He said, what do they think? That they can get wealth without creating the karma? The, the, the purpose of, of practicing the wealth deities, you know what the purpose is? Do you know what Do they, like praying to Vaisravana or they, we say Namtose in Tibetan or in these other wealth gods or Zambala, Jambala or whatever? I think you're right. That's my understanding. There may be also, with respect to some of them, offering bath to Jambala or something also creates some karma also, but creates a karmic connection with them that can help to ripen the karma that we have to receive uh, resources. It's, in, in a sense, one of the perfections the Bodhisattvas try to develop is the perfection of prayer, which allows them, when they reach a certain level, just whatever they wish for, pray for, by the force of their aspiration, that can cause their karma for that to ripen and manifest. Right? So before we have that, we may have to rely on outer uh, methods like this, like wealth deities and so forth. But it is definitely depleting your source of, of your collection of, of uh, merit by doing so. So if you do it, if you, Ribeche's point was that if you did this simply for the happiness of this lifetime, there was no, no great purpose. The great reason for doing this, like Lama Tsongkhapa, after his long retreat, what was it, uh, how many years did he do retreat? Six year retreat, I think, when he did all these, he did 100,000 prostrations to each of the 35 Buddhas, and... Uh, I think it was nine or 13 years. Yeah, nine or, nine or 13 years. So long, long time with uh, some other disciples, and made many hundreds of thousands of uh, mandala offerings and other things, saw the, the Buddhas you know, dur during this time of purification and collecting merit. Afterwards, when they were leaving, they found a temple in which that had been abandoned or, or run down, and there was a statue of uh, Maitreya, the future Buddha, that had fallen into disrepair. Do you know this, right, this story? No, 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 I'm just, no, 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 I'm just saying. Um, no, wasn't. Is that not, is that not? Uh, and so they didn't have any research. They had been in retreat for like, as Venerable says, nine years or whatever, and uh, they had nothing. They had, so what they did was someone, some passerby, some pilgrim saw them and offered them some butter. And with that butter, they made offerings to the wealth deities. <coughs> And, be, and due to that, they would accumulated incredible merit. People started streaming in and gave them offerings, and they were able to uh, re renovate the temple and the statue and put a, a, a crown on the Maitreya, a jeweled crown on the Maitreya statue, 
and that was considered one of the great deeds of uh, Lama Tsongkhapa in his life. You can read in his biography. There's a, there's a very good biography, if you get a chance, that uh, we have in the, uh, the books from the, Tibet, the, the Library of Tibetan Works and Archives on, on Lama Tsongkhapa. I'm sorry, who are you talking about? Are you talking about Lama, Lama Zopa or Lama Tsongkhapa? Lama Tsongkhapa. Oh, okay. Lama Tsongkhapa. Mm-hmm. So, okay. yeah. Yes, please. So on the other hand, um, when you displease the guru, um, is, it, is it mainly that your, your practice is not meritorious? Is that the main thing? The different things, I think, my own experience of displeasing the gurus uh, <laughs> always comes back on me. Uh, I think, you know, one of the verses we had before was, when all of the gurus are displeased with you, there was some kind of sign. Sometimes when particular teachers are displeased with us, it may be particular karma we have with them, or they have a particular thing they're trying to teach us. I remember uh, with various other people and myself, sometimes certain lamas would seem to be very wrathful with someone, but it wasn't that they were really displeased with them. They were trying to get that person past a particular threshold. You know, I remember Lama Yeshe. Uh, Lama Yeshe often appeared to be so kind. Everyone thought Lama was so kind. But if you were a very close disciple of Lama, Lama could be so, you know, cut right to the core of your ignorance. You know, it could be very wrathful. And that depended on your closeness and your, and your faith. Then the, the guru could do that. Sometimes if we don't have faith, the guru has to step back. They can't be wrathful. They have to treat us with, what do we call it, kid gloves? Kid gloves? Is that there? You know, tender, you know, okay, that's okay. I, I can't, okay, you're not ready yet. So I have to, you know, I can't, you know. Even I say one word of advice to you, you take as, you know, as abuse or something. So one has to be very careful. But sometimes when one is ready, one may, the, the guru may seem displeased, but we can see that as, the, especially when our teachers are displeased with us, it's one of the greatest ways of purifying negative karma. If we don't get angry in return, if we get angry in return, we've, <laughs> I said we've lost the opportunity. But if we see that as an opportunity, because that, that object is so heavy, even if they're not a Buddha, even not even say they're Buddha, even because of their kindness in teaching us, their heavy object of karma, and any criticism or or unhappiness. What did you? What was the word you said when the gurus are unhappy or something with us? We displease them. Um, that gives us an opportunity of purifying negative karma. There's a, there's in the teachings on guru devotion. There's a very famous verses that come in many different ways. Uh, one particular one, kind of that, uh, someone was being constantly abused by his teacher. And the other disciples came to him and said, oh, you must feel really terrible. The teacher is they're really bad. They're always criticizing you. He said, no, when they beat me, I feel it is they are giving me empowerment. When they, when they say abuse to me, I feel it's, it's like oral transmission of mantra, wrathful mantra. <laughs> so to, to see the, the actions that way, or even if it's not, even if we don't have that kind of view of our teachers, if it's a more, more mundane view, just to see that because they're heavy objects of karma, we have an opportunity of purifying negative karma. But if we retaliate or we get displeased ourselves, our ego, what's the usual word? What's, what do we call it when, when someone is displeased with, with us? What's the reaction usually? What would our reaction be? Unhappiness? Uh, defensiveness? Defensiveness or... Um, I'm thinking of sort of a reactive kind of thing, proactive. Indignant, yeah, indignant. What, what, what do you mean? Me? I didn't make it, you know, what's wrong? You know, I didn't make it. When we, when we react that way, we're just creating the cause again in the future to have that same kind of thing. So if, if we can put it on our self-cherishing thought instead, put that suffering on the self-cherishing thought, doesn't say the other. In, in doing so, you don't have to think. I'm not going to give them the. I'm not going to give them peace of mind. You know, I'm not going to take the. Def, you know, the, the, who do they think they are? You know, they've made the mistake. We should. 
if we think that way, we're losing the opportunity to practice, to purify. Actually, when our mind is a little more calm, we may actually see they have something that was very valid that they were saying, that in our state of in indignation or depression, we couldn't hear, you know, because our self-cherishing thought was so strong. So to use that, all of those occasions of the past also, when we go back over them, even though we might have acted inappropriately at some time, when we go back, we can purify that negative karma. It's like all of the garbage of our life we can use for fertilizer for our realizations, you know, the things that have happened in the past. Do we ever really actually displease the guru? Well, if you consider the, the, the actual guru being the emanation of the omniscient mind that, that manifests through either pure actual emanations of Buddha or th as vehicles through our non-realized teachers. Still, it's, it's through the vehicle of the omniscient mind. It, they're not really displeased. But there's certain, you know, in, in the sense of the difference, you know, of being what really pleases the guru is when we're practicing virtue. So if we're not practicing virtue, could you say that even the Buddha would be displeased? It's not as like that. Oh God, Bonnie, <laughs> George. Oh, I don't think the Buddhas have that. They don't have conceptual mind like that. But when we talk about in terms of our, you know, when the physical manifestations appear in the world, sometimes they seem to be more pleased with us when we're practicing virtue. Sometimes they seem to be pleased with people that we th we don't think are practicing virtue, but maybe because those are beginners that need to be treated with the tender, loving care and the, and the kid gloves. Maybe their displeasure with us is a way of helping us to purify negative karma. I know some of my gurus, Sarkon Senshab Rinpoche, used to be very wrathful with some of his disciples also sometimes. Completely criticize them in public, yet in, in other circumstances so loving. You knew that he was a great loving being. So. The, Displeasing in the sense that you know, the, it, it, one of the karma, the, the negative karmas that we create by displeasing the teachers, displeasing the gurus, is that our own mind will be disturbed and, and depressed, as we had in some earlier ones. When we displease the gurus' minds, sometimes depression comes, unhappiness comes. Let's go a little bit further, okay? And we'll come back to that. 38, when my companions mistreat me for being ugly, <laughs> it is the weapon of my own evil deeds turned upon me for, vent for venting my rage by erecting ugly images. I don't think they have the translation exactly right here. Uh, there might have been a comma in there originally. From now on I shall erect images of the gods and be slow to anger. So when my, when my companions, core means sort of like surrounding beings, my entourage or those my companions, you could say, those around me, criticize me uh, for having a bad, you know, not, uh, not a pleasant uh, appearance, being ugly, it says here. It's due to Kusuk Nensheng having erected poor quality statues, Im images of the Buddha, and Kondro Trupai, that means due to being, uh, having agitated, you know, here it says, venting my rage. It almost looks, the way that they have it here is the weapon of my own evil deeds turned upon me for venting my rage by erecting. I think you could take it, there should maybe be a comma between, there's two different things. It, it's not talking about just one thing make venting my rage by erecting ugly images that that wouldn't make much sense do you, do you see what i mean it's actually two different things by erecting poor images and by disturbing a uh, due to anger being disturbed by anger so from now on i will erect images la sheng of the deities of the gods of the buddhas and so forth and Nangyu Ringbarja, that means I will be, uh, 
I will have a very good character or disposition, which can also mean be slow to anger. Ngengu means so it can mean uh, can mean character or personality, but Ngengu Ringbo can mean patient or tolerant or uh, good natured. So from now on, so the, I will do these two things. I will make statues, images of the Buddha, and I will try to be patient and, and, and have a good disposition, not always be angry. I'll be, here's a slow to anger. Okay. Were you going to say something about it? I was just going to say Geshe had like a little story in the commentary. Mm. 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 Let's read that. What was Geshe saying? Yeah. Which page is that? Um, 148. 148, okay. So there is a story in the sutras of a monk who had a very beautiful voice. Oh, you know this story, right? His voice was so beautiful that the elephants would stop outside his house just to listen to him. That'd be interesting. Huh? <laughs> One time a king riding an, on an elephant passed the monk's house. All of a sudden the elephant stopped to listen to the monk who was in his room chanting. The king had not wanted to stop and wondered why the elephant did so. The king then heard the monk's beautiful voice and wanting to see the person who was chanting went into the house. What he saw was a monk with a very small, crooked, ugly body. He couldn't imagine how the same person could have such a beautiful voice. An ugly body and a beautiful voice seemed totally incongruous. He asked the Buddha about this and the Buddha gave this explanation. He said that in a, a long time ago, after the passing of the previous Buddha, Kashapya, this monk was, work, was a worker building an, an enormous stupa. He was tired and always complained about the work and was very negative about his job. Sound familiar? However, when the stupa was completed, he changed his mind about it. Feeling satisfaction that the work had been very well done, he, he bought a beautiful sounding bell for the stupa. These actions gave rise to different results. Because of his ill temper about building the stupa, he obtained a small and ugly body. But because of the latter, because he latter rejoiced in the stupa, in the stupa and offered a beautiful bell to adorn it, he obtained a beautiful voice. So I, I think that could be, maybe that could also be, as, as I miss, uh, was saying there, venting my rage by erecting ugly images. Still, I think, I don't why? think, yeah, by, it, it, there's, no, there's no verb in between, but it's sort of, it may be alluding to that particular famous episode. It's supposed to have been during the, the building of the stupa in, uh, I think, Bodhanath or Swainbu, do you know? When one of the great stupas was being erected way, way back at the, after, you know, the time after the last Buddha, Kashapya, and this worker was, you know, thinking, oh, God, what are they building such a big stupa for? You know, I was carrying more work to do. And uh, with that negative mind, he created the karma because of his mind being disturbed while erecting the image, Kusuk Nian Sheng, he created the karma to have this uh, an ugly form. Yet, due to the karma of creating the car of offering the bell to the stupa, he had this beautiful voice. George, is, is that stupa still standing today? The original one, I think, may have been built over many times. So I, I'm not sure. I don't. I don't know if any of the atoms that we see on the outside are the atoms that were in the original stupa. But maybe the core of that, from what I understand, that location was under. And, and at a certain point in the history, that was all under water. It said in Kathmandu Valley. And only only Swayambu, the hill, where Swayambu was above water, it was kind of like an island. But Bodhanath was below water. But they were. Stupas that were built during the time of uh, previous Buddha. Uh, I ask because I'm trying to get an understanding of how long it was between Shakyamuni and the Buddha that came before him. My understanding is that it's a very long time. Yes. So that that stupa, if we if we go now to Kathmandu and we see those stupas, we might say, well, it doesn't look like it's more than a couple hundred years old, or maybe 800 or something like that. But it could have been built on from previous stupas, you know, from, from time immemorial. Are we saying that the previous Buddha before Shakyamuni came while this, well, the, well, the, between the time when life formed on the earth and where we are now, so... Well, the, how many, which Buddha is, is Shakyamuni, do you know, of this fortunate eon? The fourth. 
is the fourth Buddha. Kashapya was the third. There were still two Buddhas before the before I can't remember then one of them was called like like Atisha Marmait say, and I don't remember what the other Buddha's name was. Of first to second. Do you know? So the, the period, you can try to calculate, uh, there are in some of the texts it says what the lifespan was, human lifespan, when Kashapya was here. Might have been, do you know, Georgie? How long the, might have been 80,000 years or 20,000 years lifespan. So you might say, well, that's impossible because humans have been getting longer lifespans. But this is talking about when people had a different kind of body before we took birth in this kind of physical body like the apes. Um, if, you, if you calculate, you can get a rough idea, I think, because the lifespan of the humans goes down one year every hundred years. So from 20,000 down to 100, which is essentially where we are now, it would be 20,000 times 100, right? What would it be? 20,000, 200,000, 2 million years ago, something like that. So that would be quite prehistoric times. So it might have been, even the stupa might have been something that was more, maybe not, uh, maybe it was something that was made of material that was much more godlike. I don't know. I don't know the story. Okay. So when, when, when you're mistreated for being ugly, um, one of the things, you know, one of the ways that you can create the karma to be ugly. I mean, to be attractive, as we were saying before, is to have patience, to be slow to be anger, as Venerable said, and also to create images of the deities. So that's, that's one of the causes, if you have the, the desire to be very attractive in order, for good reason, to, to be charismatic and to attract people to the Dharma. 39. When lust and hate are stirred up, no matter what I do, it is a weapon of my own evil deeds turned upon me for hardening my malevolent evil mind. Obstinacy. Obstin Obstinacy. From now on, I shall totally extirpate you. <laughs> that doesn't roll so easily off my non-literary tongue. Okay. 39. So when, at the time of of uh, hmm. whenever we you know when we're dis when we're disturbed by attachment and anger, whatever we do, yeah, what, you know we're, we're constantly we're either attached or we're angry. It's probably it's my my state usually. It is the wheel of my own evil deeds turned upon me for hardening my malevolent evil mind. Marum gyunyan rengsu chupai for instituting a sort of a rigid, you know, bad disposition, sort of in, incorrigible, you know, in the past, sort of like we just did what we wanted to, we didn't take any advice, <clears throat> hardening my malevolent evil mind. <clears throat> so recognizing that, in other words, the, we didn't, pl we didn't apply the antidotes before. How are we going to expect now to control our mind if we didn't apply the antidotes in the past? Geshe Darge used to say, you know, we shouldn't be too hard on ourselves when we, you know, when we, we recognize, you know, we, we, we practice for some time and we think, oh, my mind is still negative, I still get angry, I still have attachment. We've been familiarizing with these things since beginningless time. The only way that we're ever going to get to the point where the antidotes become strong enough to overcome them is through familiarity, applying the antidotes now. So in the past we've been, what's the word here? Obstinate, obdurant, what was the word they used? He uses obstinate. Obstinacy, from now on obstinate I shall totally, right? Harden, hardening my malevolent evil mind is mean mean rigid and just not not applying any antidotes just in the past so if we want to be able to change that we have to change the way that we think and start to apply the antidotes now one of my teachers Geshe Jampa Gatso in in Italy uh, who I was with for many years there 
Yeshla taught us so many of the of the texts, these kind of texts and others. And uh, Geshe used to say, uh, as, as is said in the teachings, you know, when you, you find your mind, you know, angry, you know, you're getting angry all the time, you have to apply the antidote. Otherwise, it's like the case of having the medicine, you know about these things, but you're carrying the medicine on your back in a big sack, but you're never taking it. You know, you can have all the teachings in the world, but unless you put them into practice, it's not going to help you. So, which one is this? I jump. This is what, 30, 39? So, so, Dani, ring ke, you, 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 you know, sort of rock like mind. I'm going to, I'm going to take you out from the root. What do they call it? Extirpate you. I'm going to remove, I shall remove you, you obstinate mind, from the root. So that obstinate mind has to do with self-cherishing thought, isn't it? That's kind of like one of the things that, that causes that, that obstinacy. You know, thinking we're right, not seeing any other alternative but to criticize the others. So, 40, when none of my practices reach their goal, it is a weapon of my own evil deeds turned upon me for in, internalizing a pernicious view. From now on, whatever I do shall be solely for the sake of others. When none of my practices reach their goal, drupa kangche miksu masongse, when, when we, don't, we don't reach our aim, whatever we practice, Mik, mikba means our aim or our goal. Tawa nyenpa koktu shupai. It is due to having, having set up, instituted internally bad views. What does they say here? Internalizing a pernicious view. Well, it means all the wrong views, all bad views. Tawa nyenpa means those, remember when we talked about the mental factors in the other class, there are different kinds of bad views. When we talk about the six root delusions, I tried to raise five fingers, there's six root delusions, right? Six root delusions. One of the delusions is called uh, afflicted view, and there are five of them, so sometimes we can, we can talk about ten delusions. Five non-views, like attach, ignorance, attachment, anger, pride and deluded doubt, afflicted doubt, and then there are five afflicted views. So I think it's talking, talking about these afflicted views, especially the view of the transitory collection, ego grasping, and other kinds of wrong views, holding oneself as supreme and so forth. So when we don't reach our goal, it's because of our wrong views that we've held in the past. So from now on, and, and that the particular view here that may be you know, is is the view of the self, the uh, view of the transitory collection. That means the ego grasping toward the self and all of its offshoots. So from now on, chiche, whatever I do, I shall do for the welfare solely for the welfare of others. Usually, what we do is always for our own egocentric view. And so it's not surprising that we don't reach, we don't achieve our own goals, whatever we do. 41. When I cannot control my own mind, even though I engage in religious activity, here it actually says gejor, when I rely, when I practice virtue, even though I'm practicing virtue, if I cannot, if I'm unable to control my own continuum, my own mind, it is the wheel of my own evil deeds turned upon me for concentrating on my own aggran aggrandizement. aggrandizement. I'm learning a lot today in this present life. This is the wheel of sharp weapons for not studying grammar in high school, isn't it? <laughs> I didn't know. And aggrandizement. Wow. Sedi chetap. Dangdu Langwai. So I found some other words better than that. It's when we uh, we we kind of uh, yeah we seek 
glorification. We give priority to our own, our own glory. Yeah, is that, that yeah, to make ourselves grand? Okay, is that what ag aggrandizement means? Sorry. So from now on, I shall con concentrate on the desire for liberation. So here we're talking especially about the, the eight worldly dharmas, right? You know what the eight worldly dharmas are? Beth, do you know the eight worldly dharmas? Okay. Um, wanting to hear interesting sounds, not wanting to hear uninteresting sounds. Mm. Wanting to be, uh, being happy when acquiring material things, being happy when not acquiring material things. Wow. Wanting praise and not wanting criticism. Yeah, that's pretty good. You, did you hear that? So, um, the, the pleasant sounds, sometimes it's translated as the d desire to be famous and to avoid being infamous. My teacher, Lama Zobar Rinpoche, translates it. Maybe that's where you saw the list. He said, in a more general way, it means desiring to hear sweet, ego-pleasing words and sounds, not just pleasant sounds in general, ego-pleasing, such as fame, you know, to be famous and so forth. And uh, that's different than the desire to be um, praised. That's another one, to be praised, to avoid blame, to desire pleasure of the senses, so not just happiness, but to desire pleasure of the senses. Most of our time goes into doing that. We seek pleasure of the senses in various ways. We, we, we seek material things, gaining material things, and avoid losing them. Big thing if we, if we lose anything, right? We lose the opportunity. Some people are on the on that our stockbrokers are all day long. They're, they're trading their stock, for, afraid to lose a little bit of money. Have you seen people like that? It's, just, it's kind of frightening. And um, we des we we desire to be praised all the time, isn't it? And and avoid any kind of blame. If anyone blames us for anything, you know, our our self cherishing mind, our our um, ego grasping rebels against that. And we desire to hear sweet ego pleasing words like uh, to be famous, to see your name in the newspaper. That's not so much uh, being praised, is it? You know, you went to a party and you went to say, did they mention I was there? Oh, did you mention I was there at the party? You know, you know are you invited to the party? You know, being pleasing to the ego. The, the, what's the most pleasing thing to our ego? I think the words, I love you. So most of our lives, much of our lives go into seeking that particular, hearing that particular ego-pleasing phrase. Many people, you know. And if you think about it that way, one can, it's sort of shocking sometimes because we think, I, I, I get, uh, when I was talking in uh, San Francisco recently, one of the students' wives was there and we were talking about what's necessary for life. We said, well, we agreed, most essential thing was oxygen. You couldn't live for more than a couple of minutes without oxygen, right? Or air. Then, what's better? What's more important, water or food? Water. Probably water. Without, I don't know, how long could you live? A couple of weeks or something like that. Food, maybe you could live a couple of months even. Warmth, well, warmth, extremes of warmth and cold, that's somewhere in there too. If it's really extreme, it might be after oxygen, right? And then the next, I said, is there anything else you really ne need to live? This was talking about the meditation on death and impermanence. And, one, and this one lady said, love. We need love. And in a certain extent, you can see that children, and in our own lives, if we don't, with our, our fragile egocentric minds, if we don't feel, if we don't receive love, it seems like, you know, life's not worthy, not worth living. A bodhisattva, on the other hand, they live to give love, not to receive love. So it's interesting. I, well, I think if you, th why don't you think about this next week? Do we need how much time of our life is gone into seeking love when we were kids, uh, and when we're growing up, when our hormones are, are especially you know dominating the scene, and we we confuse that with love and so forth, or or just the emotional level wanting to be loved. How many stories have we gotten into 
life stories, wanting to be loved. They don't love me. Do they love me? I love you, I love you. He loves me, I love, she loves me, she loves me not. You know, all of these. That's one of the eight worldly dharmas. That may be a little, that might be a tough pill to swallow. I don't know. What do you think? Mixed in with like ignorant love, though, couldn't you say that you need others, like even bodhisattvas, you need others to practice? So even if you have um, that compassionate, not you know, self-centered love, there's objects. For us to love, yeah, that's why I said the bodhisattvas, they live to love others. But the eight worldly dharma is the desire, craving to hear sweet ego-pleasing words. Our lives dominated by that for a large extent. We can't take that with us. It, it's uh, that pleasure that we get from that is fleeting and sometimes illusory. There we go. Excuse me. Don't want to, you know, I mean, don't want to you know, offend anyone, but yeah, ain't that the truth? Yeah. I'm just wondering if we can truly love if we've never received love. I think we can. I think, you know, one of the, one of the fortunate things is that we probably, <clears throat> we have been loved in numberless lives. Like a lot of times people say, uh, I can't practice now renunciation until I've had some kind of relationship. You know, I can't become monk or nun. I remember having some excuse like that when I was at Copan and uh, telling Lama Zopa Rinpoche, I, you know, I wanted to become a monk, but there was something I had to do first, which was the proverbial to have a uh, meaningful relationship, quote unquote. You know, not just some physical fling or something. And Rinpoche said, is that really what you want? And I realized, by the force of the Guru's holy speech, what I really wanted was to be happy. And I, when thinking about it, we project upon these outer things, the eight worldly concerns, that they are the sources of happiness. They are the dharmas that can protect us from suffering. But really, what we really want is to be happy. And if we start to recognize, use that desire, that transform that craving for these outer sources, we recognize we've been looking in the wrong direction for happiness. Okay? The real happiness comes about from loving others. We've been loved numberless lives. If we had to have another sexual encounter, another million dollars, another, before we could practice this lifetime, we'd never practice, ever. But through the force of meditation, we can, we can, we can begin to, through to our familiarity with these things, hearing the teachings, thinking about them, we can recall that we've experienced these things before. We know the truth of these things. So you're saying, in a, in a sense, we have, assuming it's been in other lives. I'm just thinking of my mom, because mm. like my parents gave me so much lo love in right. this life, and my mom would point out to children who, like, in a way, haven't gotten that much love in this life, and maybe they're sort of messed up. Sir, this is, this is definitely the argument that this lady was talking about, because she was a social worker and knows this. Indeed, that's the observation. But I'm talking about from a mature point of view of a Dharma practitioner. I'm not talking about that we shouldn't, that we say, oh, children, they don't need love. You know, don't love them. I'm not saying that. That's completely misinterpreting what I'm saying. I may sound like, I may, I didn't, maybe I didn't express it, but that's, I'm talking about someone like who is a Dharma practitioner who's already thinking about what am I doing with my life? Oh, so much of my energy seeking affirmation outside, outer love. You know, this is what everyone wants. What I should be doing is giving this to others. Then that will come un unbidden. You know, there will be people loving me to bits. You know, if I love if I love others. Look at the Dalai Lama. I mean, there are more people that love the Dalai Lama, I think, than uh, you know George Bush, or I mean, you know, his wife and his ch children maybe love him. I hope. But uh, the Dalai Lama, who loves everyone, uh, he doesn't have to, you know, he's, he's not seeking that love. He's not doing his actions so that he gets love, but it will come back to him. So let me just mention the next one here. Which number did we get up to? 38? No. Oh. We're going on to 41 right now. Oh, good. When I cannot control my own mind, even though I engage in religious activity, is the weapon of my own evil deeds turned upon me for concentrating on my own aggrandizement in this present life? Okay, 
So we just talked about From now on, I shall concentrate on the desire for liberation. So instead of seeking happiness and, how do you say, satisfaction, protection from suffering by seeking the eight worldly dharmas, because dharma means that which supports you from suffering. The worldly dharmas are that which worldly people think protect them from suffering. Having sweet eagle, pleasing words, always being praised, not, never being blamed. You can't stand that. All of these things don't, don't, main, don't make it possible. They make it impossible to really be practicing dharma, no matter what tantric initiations or, or teachings we attend. 42. When I despair, as soon as I've sat down and reflected, is the weapon of my own evil deeds turned upon me for shamelessly flitting about from one new friend of high status to another. From now on, I shall be serious about my friend, friendships with everyone. I'll just say one last thing. We'll just in, before we dedicate. One of my friends in Dharma friends in New Zealand mentioned she had had she was on her third marriage, and she was thinking of of breaking up. And one of the gurus told her. Uh, or she heard, she wasn't, it wasn't aimed directly at her, she heard, uh, beware of the, of the, uh, I would say, of the oft-married, what, what do you call someone who's a divorcee? Something like that, you know, <laughs> beware of them. And she said, oh my gracious, you know. And she realized that uh, that fickle kind of mind, never being satisfied, you know, always trying to find someone better, Never, and at a certain point, reaching, oh, you know, not being satisfied, this was so she was able to stick with her partner after that. Let's stop here. I will go over that again next time. And uh, let's meditate for a few moments to try to dedicate the merit that we've created. So in watching the mind, watching the clear light in nature, see if you can start to identify this spaciousness with a deeper meaning. As you let go of the ego, and if you've had some beginning understanding of emptiness, to recognize this spaciousness as the non-inherent existence of the self. The merits that we've created this evening through listening with good mind, with concentration, putting up with difficulty, even, though, even if the words might seem to have injured our ego or our pride, that, that virtue can't be found anywhere either. It's also just a name. It's empty. But it can be dedicated. It does have an efficacy, going back to the conventional level. Due to these merits, may I quickly develop good heart, overcome my faults, become a Buddha, a guru, for everyone, for the sake of everyone. That state itself also, although it appears as concrete and findable, can't be found when sought. It's empty of, of existing inherently, as is the action of dedicating. Try to seal the dedication in the emptiness of the three spheres. And if you get a chance, think about the eight worldly dharmas, especially, I, I'd be interested to hear your feedback next week. Do we really, you know, I, I agree, you know, so in terms of raising children and so forth, and uh, other people, we, we, ha we recognize, we give love to others because they do need it, they do sense that. But do we really need love to live? Should it be such a high priority on our list of what we spend our life energy to hear that sweet ego pleasing phrase or to know that there are people out there that care for us. There's levels of it, whether it's self-love or in the idea of, getting, of doing what we need to do. But um, yeah, I would say we have to have love. 